All right. So, uh, I'm Corbin. Uh, I wrote a new React form library. Um, it's called Houseform, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about why. Because why should be the cornerstone of all of your software. Why are you writing this? What are you doing? What is your accomplishment? Especially in libraries, there's so many different ways of approaching a problem that development experience is kind of a very ambiguous why question, right? The end result should impact your users in some way. So before I get to that, let's talk about who I am, a little bit of context behind the thing. So my name is Corbin. Uh, I uh, am the author of Houseform. I'm principal or staff or senior, whatever. I don't really care. Titles don't matter that much. Um, but I am a principal level so software engineer. Um, I lead a team with three other devs. This slide is outdated. Ha ha, thank you for the picture. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we're gonna. I'm in charge of 14 different React applications. Uh, many of which use React Native, React, um, and you'll notice that we only have a team of three, right? We're in charge of 14 plus applications, so how do we do that, right? That's a lot of code that we have to share between processes. We have to make sure that they're, they're optimized, right? Um, some of them are very form heavy. They're powered by one monorepo, which is how we're able to get so much code reuse. Uh, and uh, I also stream on Twitch. <laughs> you wouldn't. Because we're not the troll right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, what are we talking about today? We're going to talk a little about what is in a form, you know, like the, the world of forms, what is it? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how you build forms in Angular, React with no library, with Formic, with React Hook Forms, some other options out there. We're going to talk about what's wrong with Formic. Why don't we like Formic? Why am I not using Formic? What's the deal, right? Um, if it already exists and it's liked by many developers, why not use it? Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about alternatives what house form is and how it differs from formic. So, what's in a form? Um, you'll notice that we have an application off to the right hand side. Uh, it has first name, middle name, last name, uh, has an email address that's been validated, it has some people typing in the phone number, we've got multi-selects, we've got checkboxes, we've got all sorts of stuff, right? You'll notice that there's a few things here, right? First of all is we're doing field validation. We're not doing form validation. We are validating that this field has a value as opposed to the form having a value, right? Like if you think about what the user experiences, that's what they're experiencing. Many libraries call it a form validation, and that's true to a degree, but in the end, the user is interacting with a field within a form, not a form within a field, right? So that relationship is, is kind of hierarchical, and it's important to keep in mind as we go forward. Um, there's also different validation types, right? So. Uh, this email address may not be a valid email, but let's say that we do check against the database and we wanna make sure that they uh, don't already have an email in our system, right? Maybe we wanna make sure that the user accounts are unique. Maybe we wanna make sure that their shipping is, is changed properly. You know, like there's different ways you can validate a form and we wanna make sure that we can handle on blur, on value change, on submit, and kind of switch back and forth between them with context based on what the application is. Finally, there's a lot of different input types, right? So we have text, we have checkboxes, we have selects, there's numbers, inputs, there's selects, you know? It's important to realize that applications have very custom and modular UI solutions. And those solutions have to be implemented in code, right? Which seems a little obvious, but think about it this way. There's UI libraries that you may want to switch in and out. There's different runtimes for JavaScript, such as React Native using Hermes versus V8 with your Chrome browser. You know, like there's, there's mobile, there's desktop, there's, there's a few different ways you can run JavaScript. How do you get that UI to render, right? So let, let me quick detour, talk about how we do this in Angular, because I'm an Angular developer at heart. That's how I started. I love Angular. I think Angular is really cool. They've got a lot of good stuff coming out with standalone components and signals. So let's look at that really quick, right? So here, we have a form that's defined by a form group. We have a form control inside of that group, and we just bind it inside of the template, right? So the template here says something along the lines of we have a form that is assigned a group, right? We listen for a submit event, and uh, we wanna make sure that each field inside of this form is registered. So this input has a form control name, and if there is an error on this name, it will show this error, and it'll show what's wrong with it, right? Also notice that we have uh, is dirty, is invalid. Uh, we have some metadata about the fields themselves, right? So we wanna make sure that we know data about the field. We wanna make sure that we are tracking that data. Uh, but also notice that, that all of the code is in line, 
right? We don't have to have some weird complicated validation rules. Um, we, we have uh, the, the validation right in here in the form, um, and then we have the, the actual like, like UI here. So this is important to, to keep in mind because there are two different locations that you are keeping track of your code. You have your validation down here, and then you have your template up here. Not such a big problem when your code is like 25 lines of code, a lot bigger of a problem when your code is 500 or 700 lines of code and your validation logic lives totally separate from your template. So let's keep that in mind for later. So this is how you, I might do uh, forms in React without any library, right? So here we have uh, uh, a setup of validation rules for the form, right? Um, we have the form itself, which has the input, this input has the on change event and an on blur event. And then we abstracted the logic into a use form hook, right? Again, no libraries here, no magic. This is 100% of the code. The gist of it is that you pass the array of rules into this hook of use form. You pass your state, uh, which is great. But there's a lot of boilerplate here. There's a lot of spread operations, which anyone that's a JavaScript performance nerd will tell you that's a lot slower than just doing a mutation. Like there's, there's some benefits of doing it this way, but it's a lot of code. It's hard to reuse because it's not super generic. Um, if you wanted to add in more rules, it's a little complicated, right? So it's not great. So this is where Formic came into play. Formic is like, yo, look, th those validation arrays of rules of functions and whatever, forget all that. It's too complicated, it's nonsense. So we're gonna define a schema, which is defined in this case by a library called yep. Yep says that the form should be an object with a key of name. That name should be a string, be required, and have a minimum of four values inside of it, minimum length of four, right? We then pass that schema to the form, and that's it, right? Validation occurs automatically whenever you do stuff. Um, and it can be headless, which means that we can pass in our own UI. Um, but there's, there's not just the headless method. What we're seeing here is the non-headless method, right? So we have a field that field renders a text input. Yeah, big question? It's not, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I, I don't believe it is. So uh, we can't use Formic at, at uh, my company. Um, Here's why. We have some maintenance concerns. If you look at the repository, it was last published in 2021, which may not seem like that long ago, but this was pre-React 18. React 18 changed a lot, right? There's 600 GitHub issues. That's a lot. That seems like it hasn't been cut down recently. Looking into it further, there's all sorts of GitHub issues asking, is it abandoned? Has it been maintained? What's going on with Formic? Finally, someone has answered no, short answer. There are community efforts, nothing has been materialized or released so far. There's even a Formic fork, right? That's implementing a version three made by someone called John Rom. John, you're fantastic if you're watching this. You're probably not, but you're fantastic. Uh, and unironically, like, like look at how much changes has been made. Like 76 commits is authentically a lot with 300 files changed. This is a substantial effort, right? But it's not finished. It's not released yet. Further, you'll notice that the date still says January of last year, right? That's over a year, year almost a year and a half ago. Um, John Ron himself has mentioned that he's not a maintainer of Formic and that his changes cannot be merged into Formic itself unless if someone approves it. He has made a fork, but he has officially abandoned it. Um, so unfortunately, this is sometimes how open source goes, right? We don't owe John, we don't owe Jared Palmer, who's the original creator of Formic. We don't owe them anything, right? Jared's been totally radio silent on the matter. And that's okay, right? Jared Palmer's doing really big things at First Cell right now. Um, I'm sure John's doing fantastic engineering work on his, his, his projects, right? We really don't owe them anything. We're not paying them anything. We don't, like, this is just how things go, you know? Um, but as a business, right, as an engineer, I have to make decisions for my team. And if, if a library that has 600 issues, potentially breaking bugs, of shifts with React 18 coming down the line, shifts with React 19 coming down the line, I have to make a cognizant decision about which technology to use, right? So what other options do we have if we're not using Formic? Um, there's React Final Form, right? Um, it's headless, which we really like, optionally. 
It's got field-based validation, which we really like. You'll notice that instead of here, we have the field and the field has a validate function, right? I like that a lot. I think that's a really interesting approach because it basically says, hey, go validate based on like whether this value is present or not. You don't have to go look multiple locations for your validation, right? But our old friend maintenance issues rose their head. It's had 15 commits since 2021, not much better than React or Formic. And uh, unfortunately, Final Form also seems relatively dormant in terms of its maintenance. So next option, React Hook Form. If anyone's looked into React, they've heard of this one probably recently, right? It's really exploded in popularity. It's like legitimately one of the best maintained libraries I've ever seen. It's updated like every week repeatedly. Um, they, they, con they have like three GitHub issues when I checked one week. Three for a library that's used millions of times in a week? That's crazy. That's just so well maintained. So check, that box is done, right? So they got field-based validation, right? So that we can say, hey, this field is required. Um, we have a hook to define forms, which everyone loves hooks, right? Hooks are like the big new jazz in React. I'll get why that may not be correct, but, but big new jazz, right? But, and this is a big but, the React hook form is uncontrolled. Now the React team has, the general idea of what uncontrolled versus controlled means is that like if you think of the DOM elements on screen, DOM controls state. Right? Like if you don't have any other libraries, no JavaScript, and you type into a text input, the DOM stores that value in state in memory, right? React likes to control that state in JavaScript as opposed to in the browser's memory. Like it's in the browser's memory because it's in JavaScript, but it likes to control it outside of the DOM, right? React hook form has the exact opposite approach. We want the browser to control the state, not React to control the state. So this is a little backwards in the React world. This is something that previously the React team, when, when React was like kind of still new, was like, hey, maybe don't do that. We don't like that so much. Uh, and it leads to some weird edge cases where like watching data is really difficult or, you know, like it's, it's not React-y. You know, like Python has their Pythonic rules, React has their react -y rules. This isn't a very React way. Now, since, since I've written this talk, Dan Abramov himself has come out and said, hey, uncontrolled forms, not so bad, not so bad. But there are issues with it, right? Um, watching data in particular is a little challenging. Um, sometimes being able to cause re-renders can be a little challenging. Like, it's not that there's inherent problems with it, but to overcome some of the issues that tend to come with it can be very challenging. Um, on top of that, this API does not work with React Native. It only works with React for the web because it relies on the DOM to store values. So instead, there's a separate API entirely, entirely if you need to use a UI library or if you need to use React Native. So you have your controller, which has a render function. You can still have field-based validation, so on and so forth, right? But then, you know, like what if you want to use another library like Zod or Yep? which does validation for you. Instead of having to write minimum for length, you know, and, and this has to match this regex and you have to do this and this and this, there are libraries that have done that for you, right? So in order to do that, there's a third API in React hook form. This third API takes a schema, just like Formic. That schema is then reflected inside of a resolver in use form. And then you'll notice that we lose that field-based validation. So, this is great because it gives us a lot of flexibility, but sometimes flexibility is like handing someone a loaded gun, right? Like especially in, in APIs. The more APIs you have, the more likely there are to be bugs introduced in the surface area. The more you have to train a team about which times to use which API. Um, and, and then you have to put rules into place, you know? Like if you didn't communicate those rules properly and someone uses a different API than the one you're wanting to use as a team, kind of frustrating, right? So, Here's my problems with these libraries. Problems with Formic, maintenance, kind of frustrating. Uh, I talked a little bit about APIs, right? There's too many APIs in Formic as well. It, you'll notice that there is uh, the not headless version. There's a headless and fast version, but it's not in line, so you have to like break out all of your, your style, like your input components to a separate location. And then there's the, the fast and or like the fast to write code, but slow to execute code, which is the render function here, right? 
And again, it's, it's form-based validation. I, I don't want my validation to live at the very top of the file and then my UI to live at the very bottom of the file. That, that doesn't compute for me mentally. Like if I have a huge form, even if I'm breaking it up, I still want to be able to consolidate the validation and the form itself into one location. Right? That's just how my brain functions. You know? um, problems with the React final form. We talked about this a little bit. Um, maintenance issues are one of them. There's no built-in Yup or Zod support, meaning that that's something I would have to write. Not necessarily the worst. But there's unknown React Native support. And for my team, that is a showstopper in itself. Finally, React hook form. We talked about it. There's like four APIs to do things. right? Maybe a little bit of exaggeration. But there's still a lot of ways to do the same thing in React hook form. There's also very limited field-based validation. So if you wanted to use Yep, Zod, you have to eject and use form-based validation, which is, again, something we're not wanting to do. So how do we fix this? The answer is building our own, because of course it is. But if we're going to build our own, right? right? If we're going to build our own form library, Let's look at what we have to do to make it happen and what differentiates things, right? If it's gonna be formic but forked, I hate to break it to me, but uh, could have just been formic, you know? Doesn't have to be something new. So let's, let's do this. That is a small screenshot. <laughs> That's too small of a screenshot. I should have, hang on, we're gonna grow this. That's not what I wanted. Hang on, sorry, stand by one. Here we go, that's a little bit better. Okay, there we go, now we can read this. I'll fix it later. So, uh, we have uh, Zod support built right in. You don't get to check, pick, pick between Yup and Zod, just Zod, Zod's very good. Colin, shout out to you, buddy. Um, we have form-based validation. You'll notice that we have this little on-change validate, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, the idea is that when you change this field, you can check whether it's an email or not. The string that you pass into this will be shown as the error when this one fails. You can also chain this together so you can say minimum of length three and is email and is this and is, you know, so on and so forth, right? So you can change that with house form. You, so, so some of the other libraries lock you into a validation strategy this one you can change. So this one is when you change text. There's also on. Sure. So then you could change it. The, 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 here's how easy it is to switch that code. Replace on change validate with on submit validate. You're done. But let's say that someone's typing in a password. They probably want to see if their password's valid or not while they're typing it, right? So, so let's say that you want to make sure that the user has special characters, sure. that they have capital lowercase, and that they have, so you want to see which ones you have as you're typing, right? So that might be an example of on change validate. Or on blur validate, let's say that you want to make sure those passwords line up, but you don't want to have to wait until the form submits, but you don't want to see it while you're typing. Yeah. Boom, you hit a new field and suddenly you're validating, right? So this is what I'm talking about, right? Applications are complex. There's a lot of moving parts to a form, and to lock yourself down to one single type of validation is restrictive, right? Um, we also are fully headless. The concept of headlessness in front end means that it does not actually render any UI. It just handles the logic. So for example, here, you'll notice that there's this form component that doesn't render a form in HTML, renders nothing. That field renders nothing. The only thing that is rendered in this example is a div and an input. The rest of this just like handles data for you. It doesn't actually render anything to your UI. It's, it's, it's a component scaffolding. And finally, this is where React hook form changes, uh, or house form changes from it. It is controlled, meaning that React controls the state. It doesn't matter how much you re-render. It doesn't matter how you want to listen to the data. React owns that data in its uh, state. So we have, I talked a little bit about this. We have a flexible validation strategy. We actually have four validation strategies. I forgot about on mount. So you can validate something when it's mounted. You can change that validation when it's changed, submitted, blurred, and you can sit there and you can mix and match them, right? So the email that I was talking about, right? You wanna make sure that it is an email while they're typing, but then when they submit, you wanna make sure that that email is unique in the database, right? 
So what we can do is we can use Zod on the on change, and then when they submit, it runs this async function. And this async function like could be replaced with a database call or something like that, but we're, we're pretending that it's an async operation by using set timeout, right? So you can sit there and you can say, hey, this one uses this type of validation, this one uses this type of validation. You can use three different types of validation with one, you can use one type of validation, or you can use no validation with your fields, right? Totally, totally. Um, so if we do a live demo, we can go to stack blitz at Crutchcorn. We can open up this example. Yes, yeah. So here we have a form, right? Um, we're saying that this field is an email and we want to, uh, when it blurs, make sure that it is an email, make sure that it's a unique email when it submits. And then we want to change the password, make sure that it's at least eight characters long, right? And then finally, we want to listen to the other field when we are doing the confirmation page. And we want to make sure that we are validating there as well, right? So I realize this is not necessarily a demo, but the reason why this is not a demo is because house form is dying. I'm killing it today. Instead, uh, what is the name of it? It's, uh, here we go. I couldn't remember his name for a second. Instead, Tanner Lindsley announced this morning, Tanstack form. Tanner Lindsley is the person who created the Tanstack query, React query, if you've ever used it. The idea is that uh, Tanstack query allows you to fetch data by saying uh, you have a key which acts as your cache for a period of time. And then it will do the query fetching and it'll return the data. Anyways, it's, it's like the, the pseudo official method of loading data within React effectively. Like it's not the official recommended path, but the React team has officially kind of nudged you to not use use effect. Um, and this would be the alternative to that. So, not use effect, right. Not directly to load data from the server. Instead, you should use a library like Tanstack Query or RTK Query or one of these other data fetching libraries. No, no, this is an external library. I'm not the React Core team. <laughs> no, the React Core team is part of Vercel. There, there are members that are external to Vercel, so Sophie yeah. Bits is an example. Um, or uh, there's the Vercel React Core team, which is like Sabaj, um, I forget who else is on there. Uh, I think uh, Andrew just joined, um, the creator of Redux. Was he the creator of Redux? Was that Dan? I don't remember. Anyways, uh, and then of course there's like Dan Abramov and there's still some people at React itself. And then there was layoffs recently that, that reduced some of their team. Um, the gist of it though, this is the important bit. Um, Tanstack query is fantastic, works really well, super popular. Not only is it super popular, it's widely used. Um, so, uh, one, were I to go into battle with Tanner, I would lose. <laughs> well, I'm just going to be honest, I'd lose. But two, two, that's not the important bit. That's me joking a little bit, right? Announced this morning. No, 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 the, this, this is the, the other library that I'm talking about. All right. Yeah. So this morning was announced, and we'll notice that this is looking like a similar API here. We define const form from a hook, which is different, right? House form does not have hooks of any kind. Um, but then we use form.form .form and form.field in order to do per field validation. That's 100% headless. It's framework agnostic, so you could even port this to Vue um, or, or Angular or any other framework. Probably, yeah. Um, they, now, whether they have bindings for that yet, you know, is another story. But the fact that the core is framework agnostic is really cool. Um, and I'm going to be completely honest, this is a genius API. I love this API. This API solves 100% of my concerns. Um, there's still some things that I'd like to have. In fact, I've actually been talking a little bit with Tanner, um, and I'm hoping that when I meet with him in the hackathon next week that I'm actually able to work on this with him. I think that'd be really cool. Um, 
But yeah, as far as I'm concerned, this will be the replacement for house form. Um, it's not out yet, but it seems very cool. And yeah, I think this is the end game. Um, there's very, like there, there are, so for example, there are two validation functions. There's an async validation function and a validation function. The validation function runs synchronously, um, but you can change which one is run when, right? So you can run one at, at on change and you can run one on blur or whatever, right? But you can't, like, like for example here, right? You could have all four different validation types at once and all of them could be async if you wanted to. So I think that house form has a little bit more flexibility in some ways. Um, but whether or not that's a good thing is complicated because there's safe defaults that you should really consider. Like, there's a lot of nuance to this conversation. But notice that there's a little V0 in the corner here. <laughs> so like, I have thoughts, but those thoughts don't necessarily preclude me from suggesting this as the alternative to, to even my own library. Um, and I've talked with some of the other maintainers of Houseform because I was able to bring on other people since I started Houseform. And we're basically on agreement that this solves all of our problems and that we'd rather go with this route than, than our own. So this is why I said it's going to be a weird time to give this talk because this was announced this morning. So. so I have a question. Yeah. This is, I guess, your player's uh, talk about it. Yeah. Did they pay you to work on Houseform? Uh, they, they, how do I put this? No, 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 I, I'm comfortable answering. Um, I was not paid to work on house form officially, but I also wasn't, like basically the idea was that like, I had to prove that this was something that we should do, and I kind of started working on it in secret. And then I have gotten buy-in that I've since basically told them, hey, maybe we shouldn't move forward with this long term. Um, so the idea is like, yes and no, like not yet, but I was going to be working on it professionally, and then this happened. So, very weird time. Uh, it's weird to build something that's like grown semi-successful, or at least starting like like here. Watch this. If you if you look at the NPM growth, could be. Inspired them just like the other stuff inspired you. Yeah, it could be. Um, the internet here is having a second. That's all right. Is it connected? Yeah, hang on. I'm gonna switch to Xfinity. Or not. <laughs> you have the guest account? I do, yeah. What is happening? My Mac is about as bad as mine sometimes, and I have to shut it off and put it back on. I've never had to do that before. At any rate, what I was going to say is that House Form has grown from like 100 installs to over like two or 3,000 in the span of a month. <sighs> Which is crazy. Like that. Like we've gotten 400 stars on GitHub. So again, it's very weird to be building something that like was starting to grow traction, and then like I think I think this morning uh, Tanner's library has already gotten like 300 stars on GitHub or something crazy. I was like, all right, I get it. You know, that's cool. He's you know he's a well known name. Yes. Yes. So so on house form. I'm so we have. I really wish my inner, in fact, if, it, if this doesn't work, I'm going to just turn on my Wi-Fi. Yes. Uh, they're going to be very dependent. Right. Um, so we actually have started talks with other organizations. I know there's one or two startups that are using us um, for house form. And what I'm going to be doing is we have a whole documentation page, like a whole website. Um, I've put a lot of time and effort and energy into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically have like a, a banner at the top that's like, hi, we're dead. Please read this migration guide, and it's going to have a step-by-step -step process. Now, Houseform is going to survive until version one of Tan Tanner's library lands, but I, I'm hoping that I can get involved in that library to help be part of that process. So, sure, yeah, but why? Like, my question is, what benefit do I have by leaving it up? Right? Like, would it not be hypocritical to be like, hey, these solutions aren't maintained, here's our solution that's better partially because it is maintained, and then turn around and like, just leave it to die without communicating that, right? I think ancient libraries would have had an issue. They saw how they could rebuild it. 
Yeah, any, so, so that's the beauty of open source. If someone messages me and says, hey, I really like Houseform, I don't like Tanner's solution, I think you're wrong for abandoning it, I, they, yeah, if, if they wanted to go for that route, I, I'm happy to transfer the library or give them maintainer permissions or anything like that. Right, no, 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 I'm not deleting it off the internet. Oh. There is in no world in which I just up and delete all this code that I spent three months building. That's not happening. Um, but I'm, I, I sincerely believe that a good engineer can be objective in decision making when approaching a problem with context, right? Um, yes, there's nuance, yes, there's opinion, but the fact of the matter is, house form, here's the part of the, the talk that I didn't write because this happened this morning, right? Um, the, the version of this talk that I would have given, should I continue and add on to it and say, hey, here's why house form is dead, here's how it was cool, whatever, is that I'd talk about TypeScript being insecure with house form. Because there's not a direct relationship between the form and the fields, you can easily get out of sync with a simple typo. And simple typos suck. <laughs> Right, like the, the ability to introduce a breaking change into your code by, by adding one character, even with TypeScript, is a bad representation of the library itself, right? So what we've started to encourage people to do with Houseform is to break out their validation logic into an object which defeats the purpose of Houseform, right? The other thing is like, Zod is fantastic for backend. Love Zod. Zod is a very heavy function for what should be tree shakeable. And, and I'd love to have that conversation with him uh, next week. I think that would be an interesting idea. Um, One more time, what, what does Zod offer? Zod allows you to be able to do type safe data validation. So for example, you can have a TypeScript server that says my incoming packet of data should match this schema. Go, and if it doesn't throw an error back to the user as a 400 and tell them why their data isn't valid. And then you can use that same Zod object on the front end. And you can use a monorepo to share that validation logic between front end and back end. That's the biggest benefit. Like, like, that, like if we're talking like maximum utility versus minimal utility, right? That's the maximum utility using like TRPC to use it to generate your back end effectively, arguably. Um, and then turning around and, and validating that on the front end as well. Probably, I would argue. I mean, uh, looking at Express, I mean, well, it, it totally is. But, but uh, that that's a bad example. But like. Express hasn't had a major version change since, like they've been working on, oh, hang on, let me see if I can find it. They've got some validator that they offer. That Finally, the they hit beta one a year ago. <laughs> like they started working on 5.0 officially eight years ago. So again, and this is not, not an insult to Express maintainers. You do not owe anything to us. You've done an amazing job with upkeeping the library. I'm looking at the camera, by the yeah. way. Uh, you've done a fantastic job of maintaining the library, um, but there, there, you know, there's a gap here of two years, and the the, the Node ecosystem, especially with ESM, especially with you know um, um, native fetch being a thing now, especially with more native web streams, like the like, there is a version of Express that lives in someone's mind, or maybe even a different NPM package like Qua or something. I just haven't looked into it enough that has modernized the way you're able to scaffold backend databases, right? Um, so not to say that Express's advice is wrong or, or, or anything like that, but it just may not be um, the most technically up-to-date, which, again, they're, they're, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's bad, right? There's, there's very old code that still runs very reliably. But it does mean that there is a, a, an evolution that has occurred between the time that that advice was written and today, and whether that is worth it to you is is contextual. So I don't know. Can you explain the chain that we saw with mm -hmm. validation? Yeah. Do you want me to explain it from like a, a class standpoint or like? Uh, first, just like I was like, what, what, like, what are we looking at there? Like, how does that work? Yeah. So 
So the idea here is that we're saying that Zod expects a string, and that string should be an email, right? Okay. So, so what you can do is you can take this. Oop. All right, I guess my computer is just not going to cooperate with I mean, me today. The, 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 the idea of like what the format of it is that's built into. Yeah, yeah, it's like a it's like a regex built into the the library. Okay, but you could, but you could, Zod. yeah. Okay. But you could even go in here and you could say like, there's a minimum of must be five characters, and then we could say like dot regex and add another regex on top of it that requires like a, a word character or you know like you can take this and you can chain onto it forever and ever, gotcha. which makes this difficult to to. Uh, tree shake, which is one of the things that I mentioned earlier. So it's, it's pro and con. The, the pro is that it, it's a nice library, but the con is that it's not tree shakeable, so you get the whole bundle size every time. And Anyways. Um, How does it handle the two error messages there? Yeah, so it'll run them uh, sequentially. Oh, um, sure, okay. Actually, is that, no, that's not true. I think Zod returns an array. I believe that Zod, it, it, like it'll run through all of these and then it'll return an array of what your validation like errors are. Okay. Okay. So it just it No, I don't believe so. Yeah, I think I'm wrong. Um, um, Zod's a little bit more modern, a little bit. I mean, so so admittedly, marketing decision, totally marketing decision, right? I like Zod first of all. Zod is gaining popularity faster than Yep, right? And it's specifically been gaining popularity in the React ecosystem. And my library is a React first, trying to be very modern, alternative to the other libraries. You know, it's, it's kind of a marketing decision, truthfully. We support Zod is like a, a, a big selling point today. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Helps bring people in, you know? Um, so, uh, on the other hand, you had mentioned, uh, did, were you curious about how this code works? No, actually, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so, I realize we did, we're detouring from forms now, but we're, we're here. So, so, like, what you can say is, like, class Zod object, right? Actually, I'm going to switch to VS Code. Not because Sublime Text is bad, it's just a different workflow for me. Yeah, yeah. So, we might have like a, a Zod object that has string as a method. So right now we're modeling like what, what the Zod right. looks like behind the scenes. Okay. Right, and then string might have min which accepts uh, a length and an error message, right? And then we might have, let's just do email with, uh, I don't think email has anything that it can accept. Oh, error message, what am I thinking? I'm sorry, right? So here, what we might say is string returns new Zod string, right? And then Zod string has a minimum, oh, like, I'm trying to think about what an example might be. Yeah, yeah I think this is what I want to go with. Uh, function? I'm not sure this is how I would really do it, but this dot function equals function or null min says new return new zod string no this yeah. is a javascript thing yeah so so this is the nullish no 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 no, nullish call, coalescing is the question mark period. Do you know what this operator is called? It's a nullish boolean something, something or another. The gist of it is that instead, so this will handle zero or empty string because those are falsy. This only accepts undefined or null. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, I, I think that's what it is. Uh, okay, so we're going to see. Uh, no. <laughs> what is happening? Here we go. You got to remember, though, I eat, breathe, and sleep JavaScript, so I'm probably the wrong example. Um... There we go. Oh, no. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, the idea here is that Zod.String returns an instance of the Zod string class, right? Zod string class has a bunch of utility helpers that are assigned to it, right? So for example, here, we might have minimum length that uh, composes the existing function, right? And then adds in a new validation logic that then pushes onto the item. And then this object is used to pass a new instance of Zod string with that new function. So we have Zod string that returns a Zod string, right? That Zod string, that first one, has, an ob has a function that does nothing. The second Zod string has this function. And because Zod string has Zod string methods, we can chain them together. So we can say new Zod dot string dot email dot email, dot email, dot email, dot email, so on and so forth. Uh, or we could do dot min 12, please have length, and then dot email, right? So you can chain it together because we're returning the same, the same class over and over and over and over and over and over again. Oh, shit, that's how chaining works, like, in yeah. general, like everywhere. Well, well, you could even, you could even, <laughs> We don't even need to create a new instance. We could say this dot function equals this, return this. Okay, fair, that makes sense, right? Which is probably how you should do it instead. That's sure. Okay. Right, so now we can do boop, boop. Uh, wait. Right, and now a dot parse. I don't know why too much recursion has happened, but I, I also spent 10 seconds. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go debug that. But yeah, that's the gist of how this works. So, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You know why? It's because function is recursing to function itself. So what we would have to do Is probably something like this. I'm so curious to see if this fixes a problem. Oh, 
Val is undefined. Really? What? It doesn't matter. You get what I'm saying. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta learn when to give up. <laughs> so that was a pretty good demo. I get it though. Yeah. Like I said, weird time to give that talk though. It's like, hi, introducing this new solution. It's gone. <laughs> the world's fastest introduction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, How long was this like? Uh... What? Yes. Yeah. At least I, made, I, I did a thing. I guess. So. <laughs> oh wait! Now I can finally show the NPM growth chart just so I can be sad. Look at oh, it, it's it's. I guess it started going down. But look at that! That was crazy. It went up to twenty five hundred. Someone stopped using it in production. <laughs> <laughs> They heard this talk. <laughs> Quick! <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, good food. So, yep, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. How long was this, like, uh, up and, like, like, what was the life cycle of this? February. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I built version one of house form in February. In fact, I built version like 0 0.1 of Houseform in a week. Damn. Um, so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. I know, I'm really excited. If, if, if Tanner, if you're well, gracious enough to have me contribute, um, and potentially, I, I, I think it would be really cool to have like, like Tan stack maintainer on my resume. That'd be, that'd be pretty sweet. What's the, what's the, why is the, what's the, so there's like uh, tan query and react query, are the same thing, is that? Uh, react query is the previous name for tan stack query. Oh, okay. So, okay. so, so Tanner okay. is so freaking overpowered as an engineer <laughs> that the man has just decided to just go psycho mode. Um, <laughs> these are all his libraries. And, and he's just like, yeah, I'll just redefine what it means to fetch data and react. Oh, I'll just redefine what it means to make a, a virtual scrolling list. I'll just redefine, like, just invents new wheels to, to solve. Like, has his own alternative to um, Next.js. Oh, wow. Has his own alternative to um, the, the router that's in uh, React Router. Has his own alternative, you know, like, and they're not like, oh, they're an alternative. They, they kind of whatever. Like, they're really good, um, and they usually have pretty unique APIs, and they're framework agnostic. So, uh, he doesn't. He has other people do it for him. I mean, he created the things. It's his right, you know. Yeah. Look, look. Look, if my dad hadn't named house form for me, I would have called it Corbin form, you know? Like, <laughs> let's be honest here. Would you rather everyone drive uh, a hatchback? A car that is in the middle of all the roads, right? It has, it has enough storage space for people that want trucks. It's small enough for people that like compact vehicles. But, but it's got like kind of crappy gas mileage. It's got a trunk or like a bed instead of like a trunk for some weird reason. Like it's this weird hybrid of like 30 different solutions. Or would you rather be in an environment where you have cars, trucks, bikes, motorcycles, boats, planes? I think it's I understand. Or something, yeah. And you can rely on those wheels. So, like, uh, especially about the validation part, so you have to have some sort of it's already going to have some standard method of how to uh, mm -hmm. validate your data and then you just pass it to your form manager and right. you're happy. So. Right. So, so, but, but the question is like, it's a difference in, in thoughts towards ecosystems, right? Is it scary? Sure, but this is why you have like, like, 
let me, let me ask you a better question. Let's say that Microsoft has .NET, right? You know that .NET exists. Do you need to version your, your dependencies because you know that Microsoft is, is doing version? Why? Okay. So, so let's say that, that you knew for certain, right? You knew for sure that Microsoft was never going to publish a, a, a breaking change in .NET unless if it was a major version. Okay, so that's, that's a great example, right? Here's another one. What if someone had hacked into Microsoft, published a version of .NET that was bad, and no one caught it for three days? It's pretty scary, right? So what I'm saying is that anyone's fears around the JavaScript ecosystem and the idea that like, oh, there's so many options to choose from, it's a good thing, not a bad thing, right? The fact that, that oh, well, anyone can publish something on NPM. Yeah, but anyone can hack into any system ever. Yeah, I think there is a policy in this, though. I mean, you're never secure, right? Like, you're never secure, yeah, but, right. But you don't stop like, thinking, yeah, since I'm never, never safe, I, will, I can also just cross a red line because, you know, I'm never safe anyway. There's no point. But, really but, 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 but that's not my point. That's yeah. not my point, though. My point is that if you're going to introduce validation systems for NPM, you need to also be introducing validation systems for other ecosystems as well. It's the difference of writing it yourself versus someone else writing it. If you're not going to hand roll your own auth solution, you need to validate that auth solution. If someone's not, if you're not going to write your own UI library, like like there are pros and cons to not having a one size fits all solution, but one size doesn't fit all in engineering, right? Like like we just saw three different form libraries. I authentically think one of my my favorite interaction in open source ever has been a tweet interaction with the creator of React Hook form where I was like, hey, I'm actually being kind of unfair to this library in our comparison documentation. And they were like, hey, don't sweat it, you know, we're, we're cool, we're, you know, like, everyone has their own option. Like, I authentically think if you're just doing a web project, don't use Houseform. Don't use Tanstack. Use React Hookform. It's so much simpler of an API. You get it basically for free. Like, like don't use these other solutions is my unironic recommendation. But that doesn't really, like, sound easy, right? You still have to be contextual. You still have to understand the tools you're using, regardless of whether it's from Microsoft or from some guy named Tanner or whether it's some, some guy named Corbin, right? Like, trust but validate is, should be the mantra of any dependencies that you have. Like, I, what I'm saying is that no, we shouldn't be using crossing the streets on a red light. No, we shouldn't be blindly trusting packages. But you shouldn't be doing that in any ecosystem. And having a one size or, or a one solution reigns above all doesn't fix that problem, right? It's like the difference between a monopoly and, and, and oligopolies versus an open market, right? Like the open market allows there to be more fierce competition and for that competition to be able to grow and challenge each other and, and evolve. And a monopoly can stagger and, and introduce issues on its own that then you don't have an opportunity to work around because you're stuck within that monopoly. Right, so like, pros and cons to each. I really like the JavaScript ecosystem though. I think it's, it's, a, it's not without its flaws. We need to add in protections, we need to add security, we need to be safe about things, but we need to do that with any ecosystem.